Hello there. Welcome back. Today we're going to start our unit of biology. If you recall, our objectives state that we're going to try to learn and understand biological concepts. And we are going to use the ocean and ocean organisms as the backdrop to explain these. So today we're going to go straight biology and try to apply it with oceanic examples. You notice, you recognize the picture of Crash there. He's riding the East Australian Current, if you remember the movie. And this shows how abiotic, a warm ocean current, affects biotic, the migration of turtles. The plankton that we learned, the drifters ride on the current, so there's food chains in the current. Migratory animals use that current in their migration patterns. So, you know, a little biology there uh, combined with a little pop culture and fun. So how do we define life? Life's notoriously difficult to define. Uh, where does it begin? In biology, cells are basically the defining unit of life. Anything smaller than a cell is not considered independent life form. Anything multi-cell and stuff, yes. So cell is that, that uh, threshold from non-living to living. Uh, are viruses alive? That, that's a question that most biologists say no because it does, not, um, it does not have all the life functions and it does not, uh, they're not made of cells. So uh, biologists define life and the cellular unit is life. Uh, so, difficult to understand. There's a cell that is a, basically, in the center, you see a nucleus. So, there's a nucleus. You have a cell membrane, and then you have protoplasm filling the cell up. Different organelles could be, be there, simple, complex. But that's the general layout for the eukaryotic cell. Now, we've always wondered how we got here. And it wouldn't be a biology class unless we a little bit addressed it. And there's really three schools of thought. You know, one, creation. Creation's not really a science, and we're not going to address it in a science class. Uh, of course, I'm not going to get up on my soapbox and be preachy. I'm going to let everyone decide for themselves which path they follow. But uh, in science class, we're going to take a more scientific viewpoint. The, the second is it arrived on the earth by natural causes. Oh, uh, maybe a comet, an asteroid brought in an organic life form. Uh, so basically it did not originate on earth. Now in science, we look at the last, it happened by chance in the ocean generally uh, thought Earth's atmosphere started to show oxygen about 3.5 billion years ago, trace oxygen uh, indicating photosynthesis, uh, microfossils, and some of the, some of the, I'm not gonna say all, some of the processes that life would have need can be replicated in a lab. Uh, science kind of looks for evidence and then a theory comes from evidence. So being we can replicate some things in the lab, that's evidence that it may have happened and then theories come around there. They're generally accepted by science, but usually not proven to with a shadow of a doubt. Uh, but so we're really not gonna get into a spirited debate on how life came on earth. Bio 101 goes into it in depth. Uh, that would be a two-semester intro bio course. People have spent their lives studying it and debating it. We are going to spend two minutes and 15 seconds. All right, the two minutes and 15 seconds is up. Uh, life activities, though, we will look at. Living things all do the same things. To uh, Living things, cells. Cells require nutrients and energy. So nutrients by photosynthesis, nutrients by bringing in 
outside nutrients, and then energy. Respiration occurs in everything from plants to animals. Obviously, the more active, the more, uh, the more energy you need, the greater the rate of respiration. Uh, life processes accumulate waste products. So living things have to eliminate those wastes, excretion. Uh, response to the environment, environmental changes always elicit a response. DNA, DNA, RNA, nucleic acids are in living things. It's how it's the blueprint for protein and it allows that to be passed on to the next uh, generation. Living things reproduce. That is not a requirement for an individual, but it's a requirement for a species or group of living things. And then populations, it's not an individual again, populations evolve through mutation and natural selection. Life is organized. You can see cells, upper right hand corner, that is the advent smallest form of life. Organelles are little cell parts, molecules make up organelles, but cells are where you cross that threshold of non-living to living. Cells, groups of cells working together are tissues, so you're raising the complexity. Tissues working together make organs, you're raising the complexity. Organs beget an organism, and then organisms interacting with each other make populations, communities, and so on. This schematic breaks down, you know, chemical level of organization, subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, and then cells are made from organelles, tissues, organs, organ systems. Organism is the smallest unit of a population. Populations make up communities. Communities make up ecosystems. Now, an ecosystem includes the abiotic factors. So when we study ecology, we'll be introducing the abiotic factors into the ecosystems. The biome is a large area of similar climate and habitat. Not ecosystems, it's, it's large, it's big. Uh, the tundra could have micro ecosystems in it, could have, uh, but it's determined more by climate. And then the biosphere is the entity, all the areas where life resides. So we're gonna to move to the chemistry of life, break it down. Remember the non-living factors. This is the building blocks for life, but not life itself. The picture there is the double helix. That's the uh, way that DNA and RNA are, are structured. We'll get into that more. It was first discovered by Watson and Crick, or first described by Watson and Crick. Uh, Organic molecules, the ones I want you to realize, uh, be familiar with, are the alcohols, the acids, and the amines. In red, you see the radical groups. In black, you see the carbon linked to hydrogen. All organic molecules have carbon and hydrogen. Not all, they have different radical groups, and that's what makes them unique. Alcohol has an OH. Could have one carbon, two carbons, a ring of carbons, a long chain of carbons. OH is alcohol. C double bond OH acids. And then amines, nitrogen and hydrogen, H, N, H2. That's an amine. So different acids linked to an amine make different amino acids. There's 20 amino acids in the human body. So we have 20 amino acids. That means 20 different carbon complexes with an acid and an amine. Carbohydrates will be the first class of biological molecules we look at. Living things use them as fuel, burn them up. They provide structure in some living things, cellulose, plant use them in their cell walls, chitin, and then they are a component of DNA, RNA. Simple are the product of photosynthesis linked together they make starches, complex carbohydrates. Broken down, they fuel respiration. So the simple sugar, C6H12O6, 
Glucose is the most common, fructose, galactose. Those are the simple sugars. Respiration is disassembling that for energy. We living things store our sugars in chains. You can see there's a chain of four simple sugars. Our chains are far more complex, but that's an example. And that is how starches are made and stored. Polysaccharides are made and stored. Glycogen is how we store energy temporarily, and then that's converted to fats for long-term storage. Chitin, chitin is what arthropods use in their exoskeleton and cellulose, cell walls. So this is structural molecules. Lipids are the next class of molecules. Lipids are fats, oils, and waxes. Like I said, they're a storage molecule again. They are also used as a component in the cell membrane for waterproofing, and they are used Waxes are used on leaves for waterproofing. They're also used as hormones. Hormones, lipids can be a type of hormone as well. A saturated fat has all single bonds. An unsaturated fat has double bonds. Please take a look at that. The saturated fats you can stack on top of each other so they can be solid. And, and, and an unsaturated fat leaves air gaps if you try to make a stack because they're not linear. The more unsaturated fats you have, the less solid it is, becomes an oil, which is a lot of unsaturated fats. Polyunsaturated fats means many unsaturated fats. Gels, gels are unsaturated. They, because they're, they're kind of a solid liquid. It's called an amorphous solid. So these, the fats can be really solid or oily depending on their chemical structure. Lipids are found in the cell membrane. It's used for waterproofing and it's used uh, to stop various ions from passing in and out. If you remember lipids, lipids are hydrophobic, which means they block water. They don't mix with water. They're nonpolar. Proteins are made of amino acids. There's your amine group, there's your acid. The R is any hydrocarbon. Two, four, six, chains, rings, doesn't matter. Each one makes a different amino acid, but amino acids all have that end group. Linked together to make proteins. Now the proteins uh, make enzymes, hormones, uh, hemoglobin's a protein. Uh, muscles are protein, toxins can be proteins. Pardon me, someone knocked at the door and my dog's a little, uh, little guard dog. Nucleic acids, nucleic acids uh, pass, they're the code to make proteins and then they're passed on to the next generation so that unique protein is coded. Now, what, however that that uh, cell processes a protein is determining what that cell is. So the genetics of a cell is actually contained in the nucleic acid. Right now we're gonna look at the biology of cells, now the smallest unit of living things. Uh, pictured right now is a algae called Volvox. It's made of many cells living in colonial manner. So it belongs to kingdom Protista. It's a green algae, and it uh, basically is made of many different cells. The simplest cells are called prokaryotic cells. Bacteria and archaea are made of prokaryotic cells, no nucleus. The important ones that we'll be discussing in marine biology and looking at are the cyanobacteria. We used to call them blue-green algae, they're the photosynthetic ones. Eukaryotic cells, like the one pictured there, have a nucleus, have membrane-bound organelles, have a lot of complex organelles within them. So eukaryotic cells are more complex than prokaryotic cells. The cell membrane, plasma membrane, has that lipid with a phos 
phospholipid bilayer, two layers, separates the external and internal environment. Cell walls, again, made of cellulose, which is a carbohydrate. They give structure to the plants. The nucleus, surrounded by a nuclear membrane, contains that genetic material, loose DNA, but during reproduction, the DNA forms packages called chromosomes. Those chromosomes then can be evenly divided. Cytoplasm is that fluid-filled contents of a cell. The ribosomes are attached to a network of channels made by membranes called the endoplasmic reticulum. Proteins are synthesized and transported through them. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is a network of membranes that does not have ribosomes, so they appear smooth under a microscope, hence their name. They produce lipids like steroids and transport them. The processing centers are called the Golgi bodies. The Golgi bodies process what's made by the cells, package them, and send them out of the cell if it's a multicellular organism. The lysosomes, the lysosomes contain caustic enzymes that are used to break down, well, a bacterial invader, white blood cells have them. The tail of a polywog, as it dissolves, the lysosomes explode and the dissolves itself. Uh, worn out organelles are lysed. Single cell organisms use them as digestive pouches. So there's a lot of uses for these lysosomes. Uh, vacuoles are storage areas, mostly in plants. Animals have very small vacuoles and they fill with water, giving that plant, when a plant wilts, the vacuole is empty and they get wobbly. So the central vacuole is water uh, in plants. Uh, plastids, chloroplasts, chlorophyll, other plastids are the site of photosynthesis. Mitochondria are the site of cellular respiration. Interestingly, bacteria have mitochondria. Well, no, sorry. It's believed that mitochondria and uh, chloroplasts are remnant bacteria living in colonies. It's called the endosymbiotic evolution of multicells. Uh, because they have their own DNA, they have their own, they reproduce on their own, they have their own network of uh, membrane systems. So it's theorized that these are ancient bacteria that were endosymbiotes living inside of a larger cell, and that symbiotic relationship has merged them into a more complex organism. We see this all the time, like coral have algae living in their tissues. They're called, a, they're called hermatypic coral. Uh, the lichens are, are an algae and a fungus living together. So this is very common in uh, living things. The cytoskeleton, microtubules, actin, uh, and filaments are used for structure and for movement, movement, movement. Cilia, flagella are, are made of cytoskeletal materials. And there you have it, cilia and flagella, made of microtubules helping cells move. Now the movement of molecules across that cell membrane from out of a cell to in the cell or in the cell to out of a cell is called diffusion. Passive means no energy. So diffusion, moving from high to low concentration, takes no energy, it's passive transport. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. And obviously if too much water rushes in, you uh, get your cell blowing up. If cells dehydrate, they shrivel. So we, we touched upon that last class with tonicity, but osmosis is the movement of this water. And facilitated diffusion is molecules that can only fit through protein channels. So there's your cell membrane, there's a protein channel, it lets molecules in and out, passively would be facilitated diffusion, 
It's how muscles and nerves work. What happens is an impulse travels down and all this sodium rushes in and then it needs to be pumped out. Potassium rushes in, ions, and then they need to be pumped out. So the facilitated diffusion is whoop, entering without energy and then the pump is active transport removing them. So that, that's, that's active transport pumping these molecule or these um, ions back out of the cell. Removing salt is pumping it against the concentration gradient. So any type of active transport uses energy, which means respiration, moves it against that concentration gradient. Photosynthesis, we, we mentioned that. You can see photosynthesis makes glucose. There's your glucose, C6H12O6, and oxygen is a waste. So carbon dioxide reassembled with water, sunlights the energy in photosynthesis, and we get our carbohydrate and our oxygen. The exact opposite is respiration. Respiration makes energy, chemical energy stored in the form of ATP, breaking that carbohydrate down, carbon dioxide is the waste gas. So when you link them up, it's called the carbon cycle. Living things evolve. Living things evolve. Uh, one of the hallmarks of biology is evolution. Evolution can occur with a random mutation in DNA replication. Most of the time it's bad. That organism will not flourish and the mutation is lost. Sometimes it's advantageous and it's passed on. That takes a lot of time, a lot of time. Natural selection, a lot faster, changing the environment, weeds out undesirable traits. Environments change, populations change in response. Immigration and emigration are driving forces. Organisms move, bringing their traits into and out of populations. Microevolution, microevolution is changes within a species, adjustments, if you will. Uh, below, you can see before the Industrial Revolution, most things were white, whitewashed. After the Industrial Revolution, things in England were a little, they burned a lot of coal, soot was on things, and natural selection before the white moth had better camouflage. So 80% of the population were lighter colored. After the dark moth had a little better camouflage and evolution shifted it. So now you had a greater population of the dark moth to the light moth. That's simple microevolution adjustments to changes in the ecosystem. Macroevolution is a greater scale. An example of macroevolution, storms, by the trade winds and the equatorial current has rafted many creatures from South America to the Galapagos, isolated. So now you have isolation. It has been observed iguanas clinging to trees, floating on this, making landfall on a new habitat. Now, new habitat, several generations of isolation, and now you have a new species. These micro changes have built up over several generations, making a macro change. So it's a series of small changes that when you look at it one by one doesn't mean a lot, but then when you add all of them up, you have new species, new species, macro evolution. Oh, uh, that's the one that gets most of the heat, macro evolution. Microevolution is easy to understand. People don't really, it doesn't really threaten people's dogma and beliefs. Macroevolution, the creation of new species and the fact that man macro evolved from a lesser form makes people feel uncomfortable sometimes. But the evidence is compelling us as scientists to say yes, yes. This is how things happen. Nothing in biology makes sense without the light of evolution. Very famous uh, phrase in biological circles. 
So migration, migration, uh, organisms take their uh, DNA from place to place. Genetic drift, non-random mating is important for evolution. Non-random mating, if you selectively mate, you can, you know, like we did with dogs, breed in traits, breed out traits. Non-random mating is important for true evolution. Uh, then the mutation and natural selection is as we mentioned. So migration, immigration, emigration, taking traits into and out of populations. We've uh, discussed about that a little bit. Uh, genetic drift. Genetic drift is random fluctuations. So in small populations, chance can play a role. When you have large populations, though, that chance kind of goes away. Uh, Non-random mating, again, then natural selection can occur because whichever traits are favorable are what's passed on from the next uh, one generation to the next. Uh, the mutations can occur. And uh, we discussed how most of them are bad and they're lost quickly. Some are good and they're passed on. There's a random mutation, a two-headed turtle. Uh, probably not favorable. That's why you don't see a lot of two-headed turtles running around. Uh, but on occasion, there's a mistake in the DNA. Replication. And then we mentioned natural selection uh, is changes of the environment and adjustments within a species to fit these changes based on traits being better suited or less suited for that change. So natural selection occurs. It doesn't, it, you know, when you see a species evolving, one's not better than the other in terms of gold medal, bronze medal. One is better suited to that environment at the time. And if the environment changes, then those traits will change as well. So generation to generation, more of that trait tends to show up if it's advantageous. Coevolution is when organisms evolve together, predators and prey evolve together, hosts and parasites evolve together, and of course mutualism is when both benefit, and that's, that's uh, coevolution as well. Conversion evolution is when the changes make different organisms appear superficially alike because of a similar habitat. The image shown, the penguin, ichthyosaur, which was an ancient swimming reptile, and the dolphins all have that torpedo-shaped body because they live in water. That wouldn't suit on land. So they have different lineage, but a similar body type because the environment selects that body type. Convergent evolution, uh, when organisms, again, more alike, and birds, bats, insect wings, wings, another convergent edu uh, evolution. Divergent is when similar organisms become different. We mentioned those iguanas because of a different habitat. Uh, the limb, the limb, we all have a radius ul ulna humerus. But because of our different habitats and our different niches, they have evolved into different structures. So the vertebrate limb is an example of how species have diverged.